Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michaela Mormon, the Associate Curatorial Director at Pace Gallery. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our panel of Seams and Stories, The Art of Sonia Gomez, an event organized in conjunction with Pace's current exhibition, Sonia Gomez, Marina Perez Simão, which will run until October 4th at our uh, pop-up East Hampton location. Gomez, who is based in Sao Paulo, joined the gallery earlier this year and is widely celebrated um, for her art, which combines secondhand textiles with everyday materials such as furniture, driftwood, and wire to create abstract works that reclaim Afro-Brazilian traditions and feminized crafts from the margins of history. Um, as the first Afro-Brazilian woman artist to have a monographic show at the Sao Paulo Museum of Art, Gomez is also a barrier breaking figure who has described her work as black, feminine and marginal and herself as a rebel. Before introducing our distinguished panelists, I'd like to point out to you that we will be taking questions at the end of our conversation. So please use Zoom's Q&A feature during our talk to share your questions with us. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Vivian Crockett, who is the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at the Dallas Museum of Art, and whose work focuses on the art of the Americas, as well as African and Latinx diasporas. We are also joined by Kena Ellison, who is the new Artistic Director of the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro, and Gabrielle Perez Barreiro, who has worked as the curator of the 33rd Sao Paulo Banyol, and director and chief curator of the Colección Patricia Phelps de Cisneros. Uh, Fabiana Lopez, uh, who is a wonderful independent curator and writer who uh, just curated the 12th Mercosur Biennial, uh, will join us a little later. Uh, she's experiencing some technical difficulties, so we're going to start without her. Um, so with all this said, uh, let's get right to it. Um, so of late, there's been a lot of renewed scholarly and curatorial uh, interest in artists who work with textiles and whose practices are based in handiwork, such as sewing, weaving, um, and uh, knitting. It has led to exhibitions that examine how this type of art uh, intersects with feminism, populism, uh, grassroots activism, queer theory, and many other subjects. Uh, just right now, for example, in New York, we have a uh, show titled Taking a Thread for a Walk uh, at MoMA, as well as a Brigo at uh, the uh, America Society uh, featuring the work of Feliciano Centurion. So with all, you know, with all this in mind, how can we begin to situate Sonia's work within this increasingly complex and expanding landscape of textile art? And in your eyes, what constitutes the specificity of her work, of her textile-based practice? Okay, no one's jumping in. I will have to do it. Um, so I, I think that you're right that there has been this kind of uh, revival or recovery of textiles as a, as a kind of alternative history. Um, and as you say, it kind of, it's, it's very broadly encompassing these very large and complex ideas. And I think one of the risks is that we've, we're kind of creating this category of textiles and then we're, we're ramming all of these other questions into it. So it's feminist and it's queer and it's different and it's racial and it's all that. And of course it's all those things, um, but it also has, I think it's own specificity. So I think as uh, what I really appreciate, for example, about the show you have currently is, you know, so it's a solo artist and what is it specifically about Sonia Gomez and her practice that is similar and different from all those others. And I think that that question of specificity is, a, is, is sort of really the, the core question or the, the heart of the question. Uh, because if, if I compare her, for example, you mentioned Feliciano Centurion, you know, his practice was very different. Uh, he was appropriating sort of mass produced kitsch materials using text as a very explicit strategy uh, to talk about things that are not normally spoken about. And I think in Sonia's work, we, we have a very different sense. There is, there's a relationship to the recovery of abandoned material, but there's not that same textual, um, explicit sort of declarative tone. I think the work is much more subtle, it's much more perhaps inward looking, um, 
uh, you know, anyway, I think there's, there's many different ways to look at it, but I'd love to invite my co-panelists to chime in too, now that I broke the ice. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> sure. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I struggle a little bit with um, the, the kind of lumping the same way that Gabrielle is talking about of artists who work in, in textiles kind of all together in the same way that, you know, not all painters engage with the same questions, not all sculpts, people working in sculpture, you know, there's a lot of different kind of um, questions to consider. And I think Sony Gomez is so responsive to her materials in a particular way that that is where I think the conversation lies. And I think she is so resistant to kind of binary um, positionings, you know, and there's in Cecilia Fajardo Hill's um, essay on her, she talks about this notion of soft politics, with, which comes from Penina um, Barnett, and it's this idea of, you know, the and, and, it's not an and, or, and I think even in the kind of conversation around textiles and related traditions, there's still this kind of binaristic thinking, and I think a very kind of strong reliance on the notion of the textile as connected to the feminine. And I think we can talk about the kind of feminist connotations of those practices, but how are we kind of reinscribing a gender binary um, and a bin binaristic kind of thinking in relationship to not only gender, but also these notions of kind of high art, so to speak, and um, textile traditions, which we're already trying to disrupt. Like how do we recreate outliers by defining um, these various quote unquote outliers to the canons of art. Yes, so uh, well, I like to thank you all to, to start this conversation. And this for me is very important around the textiles because nobody asks around the textile with the paintings because we paint in textiles and it's not <laughs> call it around us. And uh, when I see Sonia, uh, work, I see a sculpture work, I see a, a, how she used the color and the space and sometimes even the sound because feels the, 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 the place that are around. So that uh, this kind of way of thinking we can do around just breaking this thinking around this close, uh, uh, um, close uh, word around this, this is a sculpture, this is a, a textile. Of course, we can talk around this, but we can put this to add, like Vivian said, and, and in an end. With Sonia, this is a very good example to observe. We can put her inside of a European story of art and can understand, like you can see, influence in, in Michelangelo and you can see influence in music and you see influence in how this works with her as an artist. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is very important around when we, when, when we watch uh, the work with Sonia Gomez. So let, I mean, you guys mentioned the, the importance of her materials and um, I think that just so for people in the audience who don't really know, like she uses uh, fabrics that are secondhand or gifted to her. She does a lot of research in uh, sort of set, you know, thrift shops to find these. And she um, is very aware of the stories and uh, that are associated with these fabrics. So she talks about them as carriers of stories um, and is very sensitive to sort of their emotional charge. Um, what is like your view of the type of storytelling that she's proposing through this through this use of this material and um like you know how do you understand her preoccupation with memory in particular well uh, this i can jump <laughs> and uh, around this i like to 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 put the light inside of one thing around the biography more around the memories you know like how we can put our biography, our uh, um, connections around the people that made us do something or another things. I think it's very interesting how the biography of her, because she's a, a, a black woman. So every work that she do is racialized and feminized. So her biography itself is inside of her work. And, and for me, it's very interesting how uh, as I can see, of course, uh, how this can be uh, 
she can play this game. Like, all right, this is around my biography too. You know, yes, I have memory, but which word is not around the memory? For me, the, the interesting around this that we can put, uh, uh, assume this, this kind of biography inside of the work. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting to me, and like this is just uh, like my, I, I keep thinking about uh, Sidia Hartman's, um, she wrote something about um, the autobiographical example, and she, she argues that it's not a form of navel gazing, but it's actually a way of accessing processes that have shaped history and society and that are often not recognized, that get erased or repressed. Um, and so I feel like there's, there's something about that uh, with Sonia's work a little bit. Um, you know, I, I wish Fabiana was here because she's written about how she's uh, from Caetanopolis, which was like one of the first cities in Brazil to have uh, a factory that for textiles and the factory was founded in the 1870s so slavery was still uh, being used to create these textiles in particular uh, black women uh, were, were exploited there so um, you know when there like Sonia has said things like uh, and I'm, I'm gonna just quote her here that um, my sewing makes a mark I make sure I leave the seams exposed the seams are a mark of my work the seams are the acknowledgement of sewing, not that kind of sewing that no one sees. And so this idea of bringing back to light things that have been lost, but that can only really be accessed through personal memory, personal stories, uh, an existence that has been marked by a legacy of, of violence and exploitation. Um, and so th that is also kind of how I, 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 I see her work a little bit. Um, I don't know if, if Vivian or Gabrielle, you have any thoughts on, on her use of, of textiles? Well, I think she, I mean, the way that she describes, she describes, you know, Kenyon uses this notion of sound and she talks about kind of listening to the materials, which I think is such a beautiful kind of poetic way of talking about her practice, this notion that, you know, she might start off uh, working on something and have some ideas, some kind of starting point, but then the material really dictates whether or not it's going to be hung, whether it's going to go on the floor, whether it's going to be stuffed, whether it's going to be more loose, and this kind of uh, openness, that kind of porous quality, I think is something that um, we could apply to lots of different kinds of artistic practices, right? This idea that the artist is responding directly to the materials that they're working with, and that um, can affect the kind of end and result. And even, even when she talks about her work, she, she says a lot of her work is unfinished, which is why like a lot of the works sometimes are part of series that have very, very evocative kind of titles for the series, but the individual works don't necessarily need titles because they're part of a kind of larger kind of logic and that they have the potential to then be integrated into something else in the future, which I think is really incredible. I think that on this question of storytelling, I was, I was, one thing that really struck me when I was reading through all the materials that you sent us ahead, all the critical writing on her, um, I think every text except for one told the same story of her background about the house with no floor and the house with a floor, um, like everyone. It was incredible how they, all the texts kind of touched that, that topic. And I guess what I was wondering is if this storytelling, we tended to focus it a lot on that specific anecdote. And what I was thinking about was what were the potentials to think about storytelling in terms of the materials, which I think what Vivian just referred to, the idea that, you know, these, they tell their own stories, they kind of develop with their own sort of energy within there. And then I was thinking of the, the storytelling of the viewer. Um, so, you know, what is it that we bring to the work? Because um, none of us had that exact same experience, but what is it that we project into it? And so I think that the really, to me, the interesting thing about these works is how they can bring together these multiple stories, um, not just be the vehicle for sort of the, the telling of a, a biography. And I think that's really important. And I think the fact that these works are all abstract um, invites that even more. You know, there's no specific reference. There's no representation of that. It's all done at the symbolic level. And I think by doing that, it allows in, in a sort of web-like way, these other stories to intertwine in it. Um, and, and that's something that I think it's a little bit lost in the in the critical readings that they tend to just go kind of straight to the this bi biography and then kind of and here's the work 
And I think the beauty of the work is actually its ability to weave together um, multiple strands. In, in a way. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying about the opacity of the work, essentially, and and I think that's it. it she really wants to preserve that, um, as well as the open endedness. Um, uh, I keep thinking about how you know there are certain things that are lost and irrecoverable. Uh, she, you know, and this also goes back to this multi-sensorial aspect to her work. Uh, you mentioned like the textures and, but there's also smell. Like I, I, I was reading more about her work and apparently early on she was using rue, a plant, and putting it into her work, incorporating it because the smell reminded her of her grandmother, who is such a central figure, the person who taught her how to sew, who took care of her until she was six years old before handing her off to her white father who had a very different background and gave her a very different type of upbringing. Um, but you know, this notion of the smell and how the smell brings back this, this imprinted memory, I think is what she's trying to access and how it's always a little inaccessible even to her. So like even her own biography, as much as she can create a clear narrative for us to digest, there are also gaps that can't be filled. And learning to mourn that, I think learning to care for that gap, respecting it, letting it have a place within the work is is really uh, important to her. Um, I will pause you there, Mika, because I think, you know, I, I also struggle a little bit with the kind of bio, biographical framing, which I think often happens a lot with artists of color, with black artists, with um, women artists, but in her case, I think her biography, you know, people frame it in lots of different ways. Some people like the kind of neat, again, binary of, you know, her, her black um, mother and her white father, but the kind of, there's a, there's a layer of childhood trauma. Like what she experienced was trauma and maybe those words aren't often used, but her experiences so intense and I think it, it, it's important to kind of parse that out this idea that you know she was born out of a, a relationship that was informal it was you know out of wedlock which at that time means something signifies something and that there was a clear power dynamic that her her mother was working was employed in the household um, and and had a sexual relationship with the man who is her father but she actually didn't really have this kind of emotional connection to her father or her father's family when she goes to live there. And so these kinds of descriptions and the way that she narrates, I think, especially to Julia Hebolsas, who has interviewed her so many times and, you know, shout out to her for the ways that I think she's been in, in really beautiful dialogue with Sonia. You know, she talks about being surrounded by fabric because she was growing up in this town where the textile industry is so present and this kind of notion of her kind of t the the identification that she felt with these fabrics. Like she, she says that she was never touched by her father, by her father's family. She didn't have that kind of level of affection and that she turned to these materials. She would play with kind of these bundles of fabric as a way of kind of connecting with something. And I think that that still exists in her practice. And the fact that people donate materials to her, you know, she finds materials, but then there's people who are like, you know, this belonged to my grandmother, like, can you make something with it? And the way that she kind of, she carries on the legacy of other people's memories, even if she doesn't quite understand the intricacies of that story, like that's a huge level of trust that people place in her. And they kind of want to see what she does with those materials. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah, yes, I yes. And even with this, I, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> And, and uh, with these two, I like to talk about the word, one word that you said, uh, Michaela, which is opacity, you know, like, because sometimes be transparent is not a good, sometimes we need to, to lose something to protect, to cover when we think around the fabric. Sometimes we need, don't talk, we need secrets to create something. And it's not around the mysterious thing is how to build to to connect thing I just like to to jump into the, in this world because for me it was very strong no i think that's like i think that's very spot on um i think right now we're seeing in particular how black experiences and black bodies are instrumentalized the images of black suffering in particular how they can be co-opted and how there's the way that empathy kind of fails us by creating a more narcissistic dynamic where, I mean, given the history of how black bodies have been put at the service of white pleasure. And I, I think that 
preserving that opacity is, is definitely a form of resistance. In fact, Paolo Nazareth wrote this beautiful um, text on her, on her work. And he, at one point, I think he talks about, and this is maybe where we can find some of the optimism in her work, despite the, the presence of trauma. He talks about her work as a place, as, as a place where, um, he uses the word akilombang, which I think comes from kilombo. Um, yes. Which, which is the run, you know, the communities of runaway slaves, therefore havens, um, places of safety, um, and alternate modes of social organization and labor uh, in opposition to colonialism and capitalism. And, you know, he describes her work as these banners where people can gather a quilomban and form these sort of quilombos. And, and he uses the word resistance. This is a place of resistance. Um, so, <laughs> um, it's just just to, to add uh, this uh, this talk with you, because quilombo is a word that became a verb. Mm, okay, so it's very important to 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 understand that this uh, uh, was a place that became a movement because a quilombar when you put the a ne? a quilombar you uh, became to to movement and be to understand that this place can be a movement can be a verb, can be, a, you know, like around, it's, a, it's around life, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, and movement is a central part of her work, actually. And I, I, again, I wish Fabiana could be with us right now because she was just speaking to Juliana, Sonia's assistant, and, and finding out about her process a little bit. So I don't know uh, how, how much you've heard about her process um, or got to glimpse it, but um, I recently got to interview her and she was telling me that it's really a physical process, almost like a dance. Um, and I, I just wanted to hear maybe some of your thoughts on the physicality of her work, on the sense of motion, its connections perhaps to African forms of, uh, Afro-Brazilian forms of dancing and rituals that, you know, are a part of the everyday life of Brazil. Well, uh, another thing, you're right, I'm jumping and jumping. <laughs> but uh, uh, one thing that is very important to us to understand now in 2020, it's around this Afro and Afro diasporical works. Because, uh, you know, um, as a Brazilian and probably in the US is the same way, we have the same historical time uh, in Brazil as the European. But we didn't come here because we wanted. And uh, when we come back, when our thinking just, when the movement, when the structure bring us back to the uh, Africa as a country, not as a continent with many things, it's a movement that we can, we can, we need to, to, to say that isn't work like this. We already are this diasporical work diasporical body, diasporical intellectual. It's very important to, to, to brief this around because it's not possible to understand this kind of work in another uh, diaspora, in another uh, uh, language, which is not a, a diasporical language. It's very, very interesting for me to understand. And this is movement, this is physical. This is a kind of intelligent that Eurocentric thoughts made it split it. Mm -hmm. And as uh, we can understand that this can put it together. It's one thing, this kind of mind and dream body. And so this is something, it's, it's very European work that we now can understand that can make sense, but it's not, uh, only around sense that we live and work and do. And be physical is, don't break the intellectual work of her. Uh, for me, not, of course, don't break, make stronger because she assumes this, this physicality of the work. Yeah, um, I mean, I, if I can turn to an image that I, I, I've, I kind of already shared with you guys, but that I wanted to bring in to sort of help people visualize. I'm going to share my screen because uh, I think it goes back to this question of movement and um, European traditions um, versus 
an African diaspora understanding of her work. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that's, uh, people emphasize her self-taught status, of course, and, but, you know, even though she's went to art school and she's clearly responding to uh, canonical European and, Amer and North American artists, and in a work uh, like this one, I think this whole question of motion and action uh, the way that that has been coded as heroic and masculine uh, in a North American context, how she's maybe giving a comment on that, like uh, sort of repost to, to that understanding framing of movement with her own very different take on, on, on movement and physicality. Um, I don't know if, if there, what, if you have any comments on this type of work or if there are other, um, other artists that you find useful in understanding her work or that you think are important to her practice, whether in and out of Brazil. Yeah, and I know, and I know, you know, she says that she doesn't have specific artistic reference and that she's not necessarily responding to certain traditions and that she's her own kind of artistic voice. I do want to emphasize that before I do make these kinds of comparisons. But, you know, one person that's come to mind a lot for me as I think about her work is Senga Ngudi who, you know, is about to have a show at Mashpi and knowing that, you know, um, Sonia was also the first living black woman to have a show at Mashpi. This is a huge deal. Um, and now Senga's work, I, I wish their shows had been kind of simultaneous, but I think there's also this idea, you know, Sonia fits in the histories of Afro-Atlantics, but she also could fit very easily in histories of dance, thinking about the ways that um, Mashpi organizes monographic exhibitions around these thematic concepts. Um, so Senga also being of the same kind of generation as Sonia, I think is an important kind of um, parallel and also coming from a background in dance. Like she, you know, was and is a dancer and working with Marion Hassinger and the way that she turned to materials that she had on hand, this way that the kind of pantyhose that she uses could be a direct reference to her own body um, and the ways that she's kind of manipulating that and subjectivizing space to borrow Cecilia's term here for Sonia, um, the way that she can kind of manipulate um, space and evoke kind of movement um, and have lots of different reference on hand for something that looks non-referential and abstract, but in fact, like we can read bodies and we can read movement and we can read the process of the making because I think, you know, as much as Pace Gallery and the art world wants to, um, you know, think in, along the logic of a finished product, a product of an artwork, right? I think Sonia also thinks about her work in relationship to the process. It's an, it's an active thing always, even if there is a kind of manifestation that is um, an artwork at the end of the kind of process of making. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's kind of why I also brought in these images of the work, the way that she installs her work, how how it you know orchestrates space. Uh, and let's like let me bring some of these images to light. Um, uh, here, going. I mean, we can see how um, this particular work. I'm just gonna go to slide view. Um, so we have Vo, which is you know, as it's it's currently in our gallery uh, in East Hampton, but we can also see how it is here on the right installed in nature in this sort of courtyard on a tree and part of a greater assemblage of, of a piece. And then um, we also have her installation at uh, the Casa de Vidrio, where here she's really responding to the architecture of Lina Bobardi. And she's, uh, this is the, the tree that is at the center of the of the house um, and she's installed her work there too so you know really subverting the distinction between inside and outside which is already part of the architecture um, and then you know we can think also of how she lives with these works and uh, how you know for many years before she exhibited um, she was making this and this is her studio um, so we can see sort of the continuity almost between everyday objects and and the work um, and then finally, I, I mean, I love this photograph because I think it captures all the challenges of, of trying to um, exhibit her work in a sort of traditional way. If we want to consider the glass, the Lina Bobardi's glass easel as like the, the official way that Maspi likes to present works in its permanent collection. Um, so 
let me go back to, to you. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on the sort of address to the viewer uh, that these installations um, encourage or, or uh, perform? I would, I would maybe go back to that beautiful word you used, which Katie had picked up, which was opacity. Um, and I think that for me, when they're placed in these situations, what you have is this really interesting um, vulnerability. So it's, it's not an opacity that is dense and closed and hidden, which is how we tend to think of um, opacity, but an opacity that is about being open and being somehow temporal or being contingent. Mm -hmm. And I think that that placing in the outdoors, especially, you know, where the contingencies are there, something, it might rain, it might, somebody might walk by, they might hit it, an animal might come through it. Um, to me, that invitation for the sort of open-ended uh, status of the work is, is what makes us so compelling. The fact that, you know, they're, she's, she's responsible for half of it, and then it's the process of handing it over you know, for even in its display to a situation that will multiply and uh, sort of finish the, the authorship somehow. Um, so, so I find that very connected to this idea of opacity, but opacity is something that is fragile, open-ended, and literally with the open space, which is something that's so common in her work. So more, more than half the work is empty space. And I think that that is intentional. Yeah, I, I love this notion of vulnerability that you bring up because my experience of, of encountering this work at Maspi and at the Casa de Vidrio, especially when I saw that piece on the tree, was almost like feeling like I was no longer at the center of the work. The way that a traditional, like if you think of like a painting with perspective, the way that it centers you as, as this viewer who has total visual omniscience, um, I, I feel like the way that her work is so open to nature outside, you know, and like, and it sort of makes the architecture of Lena Bobardi erupt to this out, outside uh, in, in a way that is perhaps even more radical than what the architect had originally envisioned. Um, to me, that pushes me to be in a position of vulnerability where I, I am just one of many things in the world that Sonia is erecting for us. Um, yeah, I don't know if any of you guys have other comments on on her her architectural interventions really yeah and I, I would say i mean in the ways that i've heard her describing this process it's not that you know there's the interior of the casa de vidro and the outside it's this extension it's this notion that the outside is in dialogue which was something that you know lena bobardi is interested in and I think Sonia is thinking about not only, she's not trying to imitate nature in her manipulations, but rather kind of be in dialogue and understand the kind of the ongoing kind of co-presence of the outside and the inside. Um, yeah, and I just, I think back to this other kind of biographical anecdote, but I think it's so interesting to think about. Um, oh yeah, Fabiana's back. I can't oh, wait to hear from her. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop there and have um, her, um, speak a little bit because I didn't want to backtrack also to think about this question that you asked about, around like movement and her relationship to movement and maybe Fabiana can weigh in with um, what she heard from the perspective of, of Sonia's um, assistant and also um, yeah I'm also curious to see what other kind of connections to other artists that um, my fellow panelists see with her work because I think that's a really interesting note to explore. Fabiana, do you do you need a minute to to or to orient yourself and catch your breath, or are you ready to jump in? I don't know if you've heard any of the topics we were talking about. Oh, I think we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, okay. It might be the microphone settings, the privacy settings, but yes. Mm. Maybe she needs to leave and come back again. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a shame. Okay. Yes. Oh. We love you. <laughs> uh, it's a shame. Such a shame. But uh, just to, to, I want to add uh, around what Gabrielle and Vivian said around the the Sonia work and the, to put more not more, but to put around this, uh, when, when we show the, the work, 
the work uh, in Casa de Vidro and uh, the Para de Kooning is very interesting when, when she put the, the literature, how the work of Sonia Gomes put us a literature because we said around the movement of the body, we said around the, the sounds, but have a kind of literature that bring us to when, when she, in the work in Casa de Vidro is the Still I Rise, bring us Maya Angelou. And maybe, I don't know if she wants uh, us to understand this, this uh, poem or understand that Maya Angelou is she too, or but brings to, as a creator, it brings to me this understanding that that uh, uh, amazing historical uh, uh, weight inside of her made us, uh, uh, made, made us understand many things, but above of that still arise, you know, like. And for me, it's very interesting around this. When Sonia did that uh, para de Kunin for, uh, to de Kunin, because it, it is a huge, strong part of the history of art. Mm -hmm. And she is inside of history of art, you know, like I am inside of this world. This is for you. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very interesting how, how she put inside of, of us this kind of literature. And I like to say around literature because we need to, to read this, you know. It's, it's something that I, 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 I wanted, I, I needed to add. In no, our I talk. Thank you for adding that. I think it's such an important um, part. And I have like a few Sonia quotes, gems that I hope to maybe we'll end on some large Sonia quotes. Um, but yeah, I think this question is really important also around Para Jukuning, which I also thought about as like, you know, our understanding of European modernism too. It's this notion of, you know, I don't know, it's, it's always like artists of color are always positioned as responding to that in some way, but that work would not exist were it not for <laughs> the continent of Africa, if we're not for African diasporic notions and knowledge and colonialism and imperialism, those are part of that encounter inherently. Our, our understanding has suppressed that um, and history has suppressed that, but that is a huge part of what influenced artists like de Kooning, not the other way around. So Sonia in a way is being like, here, here, darling, <laughs> here's a kind of, you know, restructuring that power dynamic that shouldn't have been that way to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely agree with you there. And it, it's also, um, the way, I, I think with the de Kooning piece in particular, like the way that um, she's also, and I think it's also like not, apart from being a sort of intervention into our very linear and uh, narrow understanding of what constitutes modern art and who's determined that, um, she, I think there's also a sort of bit of a, a commentary there about her own practice. Um, so the uh, this this came up for me when i was uh last talking to her and she described drawing as a a huge part of her practice like almost like as a the bedrock um and the way that uh, she thinks of her sculptures as these lines in space like there it's it's a form of drawing in a three-dimensional space and uh, the way that you know uh de kooning himself in his own career went from painting to sculpture and like drawing all of that and like in a ways that every single time he was like praised for switching his medium and I think that she's also kind of you know deciding that she's going to have that prerogative that she's not just working with textiles she's not just a sculptor she's also like thinking of her work in terms of painting in terms of drawing and she's looking at I think like a figure like de Kooning and saying well if, if we allow these artists to like step out of these box and be and 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 like me too, right? Like she is also, I think in like aligning herself with him, it's both a, a way of subverting him, but also of, of empowering herself and like taking some of that power. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, co I completely agree with you. Um, <laughs> Gabrielle, I think you wanted to say. About, yeah, just, I, I mean, what I find interesting about that de Kooning piece is that it's not a simple binary 
um, opposition, you know, like the Kuning is bad and we are good, or it, it's, a, it's a piece where the, the, the badder, like two, it, it's completely ambiguous. It, it's like, is it two as in, you know, fuck you? Is it two as in I'm giving you a gift? Is it two as in I'm taking something back? Like there are so many complexities in that relationship and they're left there. They're left there sort of unsaid, but deeply implicit in the, in the object. But I was thinking when you're talking about the painting sculpture and sort of the, that tradition, um, the historical, the, the kind of obvious historical reference for me was Fahira Guler and his idea of the non-object. So in 59, when he talks about the non-object, he really talks about wanting to break this dichotomy between sculpture and painting, you know, that there is an object that can, that is, that is a non-object that occupies this completely different space. And I think there's, there's a line we could also draw, um, you know, into that specific tradition of the relationship with nature, with the body, with the line, uh, with the temporal, you know, all of those were worked through very, very famously by now in neoconcretism. And, and it's not trying to put all Brazilian art into that neoconcrete um, line, which is a really tedious exercise. Um, but, but I think that there's, there's at least a, a sort of a tinge of that um, with so many other things that are going on in the work. That it's, not, it's not trying to say that's the one or even the most important, but I think it is there, that it's present. I mean, my brain couldn't help but go there either. So I appreciate you bringing that up because when we were looking at the images yesterday, you know, I instantly went to, and of course my mind always goes to Oichisika because I like eat, sleep, dream Oichisika, but like the homage to Mondrian, right? This kind of strange biology that has a sculptural form and it has this fabric that's kind of coming out of it. it looks like a Molotov that you throw. So it has this kind of movement quality to it and the kind of parallels that I would say problematic parallels that um, are drawn sometimes between that Baluigi and the Parangoles. And so um, I think that's very much present, but then I love this idea that Gabriel is talking about the kind of ambiguity in Sonia's title because with Ochisika, it's homage to Mondrian. Yeah. The Spada I think is much more open-ended, which is kind of nice to explore as well yeah, yeah definitely no definitely. and and if we can still play in we can be stop the cooning because <laughs> can be stop the cooning too like <laughs> oh that's wonderful um well okay uh so we are nearing the end of our time before we have to go to q a because we want to give usually about like 15 minutes or so um is are there any other uh like comments or insights or things that you wanted to share uh that i maybe we didn't explicitly i didn't explicitly ask you about oh my so many things i don't know we have we have very a limited amount of time but um we are yeah, okay now. i wanted to share just a couple of quotes mm -hmm. from sonia before we kind of open it up and maybe that will open up into some questions or um but there's one that i think relates to some of the things we've talked about that really struck me um and she says you know thanks to recognition and this is a sign of this i'm in a circle of privilege but my work is marginal and remains as such because what marginalizes it is beyond the walls of the museum it can be at MoMA, but it still remains marginal because we are talking about the work as a body, not as a place, which I think is really incredible. And I think ties to this other quote um, that says, my work does not raise a political flag, but it is extremely political because the body is political. Art is the body. The racism present in my life, di in my life directly because of my body, which reflects in my work. Oh, sorry, the racism is present in my life directly because of my body, which reflects in my work. The color, the mantles, the knots all reflect Africa and Brazil, reflect the black. It is an aesthetic, but it is the result of a subjectivity. I do not use aesthetics as a political tool. My body is political. The ancestral is reflected in the work. It is not an intention of mine to make black art. I do it because I am black, because it reflects my body, my history. Yeah, I mean, this, it's interesting because you were talking about Oitisika and this notion of marginality. I, I, I've always been a little troubled by the, you know, when she talks about flags too, about Oitisika's banner with Cara de Cavallo's dead body and the message to be a hero, be marginal. Um, do you, how do you, do you think there's a relationship there? There's a connection there? I mean, you're the Oitisika expert, um, or do you think, 
Like, do you also feel like it's maybe problematic? I mean, I understand that he was close to Cara de Caballo, but I mean, how do you, is this like a false connection or do you think that there's a little bit of, uh, like this is part of like the history that she's thinking about when she's I making think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there with this. I don't think, I think this is her space. <laughs> like, let's bada, bada what you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but we can talk about that <laughs> on another occasion, I think. Um, but yeah, I think her invocation of marginal, I think, does apply in that sense. It's kind of the marginal beyond the kind of scope of marginal to the canon, but marginal as a kind of social political condition, um, I think, is interrelated in that sense. I just uh, uh, remembered, it just came for me when you, when you, bring us the, this quote and uh, when I talked about the literature that brings that Sonia making brings to to me and to us I just remember Pina Bausch because uh, it's not around only the movement but how work inside of an institution which is the dance and now we are talking about art can understand in this this peculiar but uh, everyday life movement, and of course, is around uh, 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 be racialized and feminized in this uh, uh, binary world. This, you know, like it's around this, of course, and how this movement inside of her made this uh, uh, part of the art. It's uh, uh, when she put this, this. Uh, art in in the world i think she brings something you know i just remember her because the company that she made it is around this movement but everyone that needs to be inside of the group to be to be a pina Bausch dancer you need to know the classic ballet you need to understand the classic ballet to be inside of to dance together to think around together and I just uh, put it they, they, uh, together because we, we have this, she doesn't leave this uh, European, North American and like this uh, occidental split way of life to understand how she can work. And this is very strong of her. And of course it's marginal, but it's inside of this understanding where is the center no, this is the, <laughs> and the, this this for me is, is very strong on her and like just want to to add more. Okay. Um, okay. So actually, we have uh, a comment from Fabiana. Like this is maybe a way of like getting her to be a little bit more part of of this, despite the difficulties. But she. I uh, was saying that in the, she was in, in line up with uh, Gabrielle's thinking on the non-object, maybe when we think of her practice in general, it may give way to a different set of questions to engage with her work that would go beyond her biography, for example. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I don't, is she still connected through the chat? I don't know. It would be great to have her chat in. We have a very shy audience here. Just yeah. More no no question he's, he's, he's like, but uh, yeah I, I mean I'm curious what other kinds of you know not to compare her strictly to other artists but I like I, I like I personally like the exercise of thinking about you know what would you maybe put in a room with Sonia's work as a form of kind of asking new questions maybe beyond um, biography so I'm wondering if Gabriela or Kena have any ideas around that you know, I was thinking a lot about Mesh Gigi also, but knowing that for Sonia, the kind of spiritual dimension isn't necessarily connected to kind of um, religion or um, strictly kind of that form of kind of ritual, but is more of a kind of larger open-ended notion of spirituality. But I think a lot about um, his objects in relationship to her work or someone like Dunga or maybe other reference that you guys have. I think more than specific reference, I think Fabiana's question, you know, is kind of like, what, how else, you know, how else do we approach things? And I think part of our problem is we, we want to see these objects as carriers, as, as ventri ventriloquizers of cultures, traditions, um, you know, positions, political, uh, 
you know, ideologies. And I, I think one of the ways to think about it is with this question of experience and the relationship with the object. And I think we still, in this, within this critique we're trying to do of the Western rational um, predominance, we are constantly doing it too, because we're constantly saying, what does this work mean? What did they want to do? What does it actually mean when I take what they want to do and contrast it? And I think one of the most radical ways, and it's one of the simplest ways, is, is to talk about our experience with it, uh, because that is something that is potentially emancipating, is something that um, is complex and dirty and mixed and um, absolutely subjective, because we see these works with our body, with our eyes, with our nose, you know, with all of these things too. Um, so anyway, I just think, I think that in a sense, you know, when we have these conversations where simultaneously wanting to exit a set of references and at the same time using them, you know? So I, I feel that we, we're constantly right on that edge and I don't know what the solution is and obviously I don't have it, but, but I do think it, it's something to do with experience. <laughs> That's as far as I could say. No, I think there's definitely been, I think in a lot of the literature, actually, I was surprised to see that her work is usually paired or discussed in comparison with Arturo Bispo uh, de Rosario, which is, I think, a really problematic comparison uh, as an outsider artist who is not dealing with the history of art the way that she is um, and is operating from a totally different context. Um, I think, I mean, I don't want to speak for Fabiana, but I know that she's written about this and she's uh, definitely uh, discussed her work in relation to uh, Rosanna Paulino, for example, and these questions of memory. There's also an, ax an aspect of, of textile and handiwork to Rosanna's work, um, Janaina Barros, um, and um, Ligia Lisboa, I think, was like the other person that she was citing as, uh, you know, other contemporary artists in Brazil who are kind of dealing with similar themes or, or materials and approaches to art making. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I, I, none, I, the performative, I think is actually perhaps, I mean, I, I, I feel like that was very spot on when you brought that up, Vivian, actually. I don't, I don't think there has any, I don't think people have really discussed her work in relation to other artists who are concerned with the performative. Um, Kena, I don't know if you also have some, like an imaginary exhibition, group exhibition with uh, Sonia's work. Well, I, I'm, I'm just this crazy person that think around the curatorial thing, like I remember Pina Bausch, I'm just starting to remember kind of movies, you know, like, <laughs> because it, for me it's, it's around a, a thinking, you know, like I, I remember Kurosawa when, when the, uh, I see Sonia Gomez, because the way that she worked with the so uh, uh, oriental way, but connected with occidental way, you know, like, uh, it, it's it's uh, because I, I can understand that this literature that brings us the art for me uh, it's very open-minded uh, and uh, for me it, yes it's, it's I, I have a lot <laughs> I have a lot I just bring this this two but I can I, I will think more and I will I, I will pop it I promise <laughs> um, so we have one question coming in and also a, a comment from Fabiana. Uh, so let me get to the question first. Um, can you speak a little more to the role of performance and perceived ritual within the work and its construction? You mentioned they remain open works somehow and not merely static or mute. Is that the role of the performance within the work, the twist, turn, and social histories embodied within the textiles, bodies, inferred, and used? Should I reread that? Yeah, and I think there's a few more questions and we don't have that much time. So should we throw in all the questions and see which ones you want to answer? Um, this, and let me see what Fabiana's, I just lost her, um, the window where she was uh, commenting as well. Um, here we go. Oh, so she says each series king, oh, each series kind of require a set of questions. If we think about the bundles, uh, all the objects that we may find hidden, a doll, a needle, um, etc. Uh, performative. Sonia comments how her drawing practice improved after doing one year of dance with Benjamin Abras. Um, 
Okay, so the, she's also she's commenting on, on two things. I mean, we haven't yeah we haven't really discussed all the objects that are hidden within the work, um, which almost kind of suggests this process of engaging with the work and taking them out and finding them, which would be a participatory dimension that I'm not sure is allowed. I, I guess it's just there for us to know that it's there. This goes back to this notion of, of the secret that you were bringing up, Kena. Um, I can review the the. The other the the other question that we got, I mean, regarding the performance uh, and the ritual within the work, unless that's not interesting for you guys to. There is a couple. I'm just seeing some more questions here. There's one about asking us to actually talk about the work, which I think is an important part. Maybe look at some of the images in the PowerPoint before we go. Yeah, I mean, I don't see those questions come up. I wonder what... Her education. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Adele Nissen is saying, I wonder if you guys could talk about her education at Escola Guignard in terms of Kena speaking about being inside and outside Occidental ways of thinking. Um, do, we, do, you, do we know anything about the Guignard school? Um, I don't know much specifically about that school, but I think it's interesting that like, you know, she talks about going, she goes to school in her 40s, right? This idea that she goes kind of to reinforce what she's already doing to kind of almost, it's like this kind of process of validate. And I know so many artists, I have so many friends who have gone back for MFAs just so that they have the kind of degree that says, look, I know the things that I already know, um, but it's this kind of strange dance that artists often have to do. Um, and I think it's connected also to this idea of drawing, like the fact that, you know, part of what, discouraged her earlier on from identifying as an artist is that she didn't draw in a kind of traditional kind of classical um you know art fine art framework um but in fact you know through that experience learning and ha having it affirmed that you know what you do is art what you're, you're drawing is drawing um and that there's many ways to kind of arrive at art making yeah, and, and the interesting around this the drawing thing, because uh, when we draw, when we start to draw, when we are kids, it's a movement to bring the world to our hand. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you can understand that you can uh, keep the world with your hand. And when, when you're a grown up person and start to understand this in the kind of power, not only in a kind of, of intellectual, uh, ritual and let me bring this word uh, for this it's very interesting and uh, how the the movement is to split the things is already said it you know like if you and, and have this I, I don't know how to draw I'm not a good drawer I don't know like because but it's just the way when that you put the word in your hand and this movement brings us to this word artist this word bring us this, to this word because you can put your hand and show what what is the word with your hand and start with the drawing start with the, the movement that made that we made uh, very naturally i don't like this word naturally oh did she freeze um no yeah i, I... You, you see this and, and you can see uh, no, I, I think it's also very interesting that during this this moment of quarantine, this period of lockdown, Sonia went back to drawing. She was explaining to me that she just did many drawings, uh, in, in part in collaboration with Marina Perez Simao when they were together at a farm. They sort of fed off each other's creative energies and created a series of drawings. But she also, in her own studio, was doing her drawings. And you know, there's a certain amount of I think uh, almost like a, I mean, this is also part of the performativity of the work, but she kind of enters a state of automatism or trance where she's creating these shapes and she doesn't, she was like telling me that there were a lot of circles and she doesn't really know why that was the shape that was popping up right now, but that she's still kind of working through it through drawing before she even gets to sculpture where maybe some of these forms might be echoed. Um, I have maybe time for one more question. Um, uh, I would like to ask, oh, it's for Kena. Uh, I would like to ask Kena about how she sees the fact that Sonia got broadly recognized as an important artist, as an elder woman, woman, and how this is like a rule mostly for Black women in Brazil. As example, we have also Lucia Laguna and Rosana Paulino. 
well, this is not a rule only in Brazil. And uh, let me <laughs> tell this, this I know. And um, it, it's, of course, it's important to phrase it. it. It's not only about what I feel, because uh, as a creator, I could understand uh, that I am a creator very, very, very late and already working and thinking around art. And I already have one thought around this. And then one day I say, oh, I'm a creator. And I could understand <laughs> that this is something that, why I wasn't thinking that I could be a creator. And this is only around me. But after that, have this structure. Well, as a creator, how can I keep being a creator, living with this, working around this, doing around this? But well, now we can understand every every time more that you cannot do this alone we need to understand the structure and make the connection and make you know around friendship and bring one diasporical way of thinking that is a i love it have, <laughs> have have a, one word in brazil that is pagode that i read said to vision my great friend. Pagode is something that people can think it's around the party. It's not only around the party. It's how to bring together a lot, a lot of intelligence together because we need to eat, we need to dance, we need to drink, we need to talk. And in the end of this, we need to bring something to the world. Sometimes it's a samba, sometimes it's a child, sometimes it's hard. It's have many things. It's, it's a movement to bring that that made us understand that doing a pagode we can make the world works you know i mean pagode in east hampton <laughs> get us there <laughs> well we're out of time so i think this is a great note to end on uh, thank you so much to each and every one of you for participating today in this conversation and for everybody out there for tuning in um, Keep, keep, being, uh, keep checking our website for future events that will be happening through our Pace Live channels. Oh, yes, thank okay. you for the invitation. And it was great to be with you, Gabriel and Vivian. And I miss Fabiana a lot. I know. We all did, yeah. We, have, we should hopefully call her back. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye thank you. All right, so Fabiana, thank you again for joining us a second time. Uh, so the first time, I'm, you, I believe you got to listen to the entire panel, but because of technical difficulties, couldn't really chime in and share your thoughts on certain topics that we discussed. So I wanted to you know, give you the opportunity now in a sort of brief 10 to 15 minute conversation to share some of your thoughts. Um, and so some of the first things that um, I, we, 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 I'd like to discuss with you has to do with um, Sonia's process uh, of making these works, because it's my understanding that you got to speak to her assistant, Juliana, um, and have a little bit more insight into what her um, studio uh, activities are like when she's you know, actively creating this work. So. Um, yeah. Tell, well, tell me what you you know. Tell me what your insights were on. on I think, I think before before jumping to what Juliana said, I think one of the things I've been thinking. What I think is important to when we think about um, Sonia's textile based practice is uh, thinking of what she does with it. Mm -hmm. I think maybe sometimes we have a set of questions that don't guide us or or take us from that. What is it that she does? She does what she does is repurposing. Mm -hmm. uh, usually clothing, right? And in this process, what I notice is that she has a practice of undoing mm -hmm. and then redoing. Mm -hmm. So, and I think if we, if we carefully look at what is it that she does when she's undoing, it may give us some windows on about what, what is it that she's doing, what, what her, is her practice about. Uh, and the same thing with the doing. For instance, when she 
in the process of undoing, you see, and I think Vivian mentioned something about listening to the object, right? And I think Sonia even uses a, a, a phrase which is, I'm experimenting the fabric. So I don't know, she received a gift, a, a, a dress, and she said, I was figuring out what to do. And uh, I was, she doesn't use the word listening, but she, she says, I, I, I was experimenting. And I was asking, well, experimenting, what do you mean? Well, I'm trying to see what, how the fabric is, how the dress is. In the case of this specific dress, which is the, the, the wedding gown. Wedding dress, she, yeah. And she said, uh, I thought it was really, mm, the word that she used was, in Portuguese was sobrio, but serious. It was a serious, it was kind of intact. So I, I couldn't do just everything with that. So then when we look at the pictures, I just saw it in pictures, and you see the way she was, when I was undoing it, I was still experimenting. So I, I, I think just paying attention to these details of her practice can give us some windows. And, and the same in the process of redoing and redoing when she's doing her own object. Because if we think, for instance, about uh, this, the bundle, bundle series, Las Trochas, it's a specific process, a process that it seems to, to have to do with accumulation, we could say, adding layers, because it's lots of layers, lots of layers in those bundles, right? Or, but if we, if we think about the torsões, the twist, then it's something else, the one that she does around the wire, and then it's something else. If we think about the, the series that she did with the wood, which is not just wood, it's like a piece of the, um, of the tree. It's not just a regular wood that you go and buy. But it's, yeah, it's, it's driftwood, often reclaimed wood, a wood that has a history that's, that's actually yeah. exposed to water, to the elements. Yes, or the, the trunk, well, how do you call it? The, 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 roots, trunk. the roots and the trunk. The roots yeah. Of the, yeah, so then it's, you know, it takes you in what she does, how she applies or uses the fabric with those pieces of objects. If we think about the cages, I think each of those series, what she does with the cages. Yeah, there's something really yeah. emancipatory about that gesture of breaking them open. Yes. Um, but uh, so I think, I think those are, I, I really think that's important to uh, slow down and think about her process in each of this uh, part of her practice that undoing, undoing the cage to remake something else, right? And the, the one of redoing. And then going to your question, when I was, I was talking to Julia, well, let's, let me just comment on like, because I think what you're saying is like super interesting to, to think about this undoing because a lot of the materials that she's getting are, are mass produced, are textiles that were made in the factories. And we've already described a little bit in the panel, some of the history of those factories within Caetanopolis in Brazil. And yeah. it's, it's interesting to me that it's, you know, she uses the word intervention a lot when she's describing her practice. So it's like taking these mass produced products with there's like such a machine quality to them that really hides a lot of the labor that the hand you know the, the the human labor that's behind them and then she brings back in the hand like her personal touch and like the sort of irregularities that come with that and i, I feel like i i love this sort of tension that the work as a result creates because with the cages for example you can it becomes very apparent right you have this structure that is there that is you know architectural almost yeah. and completely erupts with her textiles. And I think it, in a way, what she's doing to the space of the cage, uh, when you look at the, her, her installation works and the way that they also inter intervene in the architecture, oh, it's yes. almost like a mise en beam of that. So there's, there's this multiple layering that happens with her work. Um, but yeah. anyway, yeah, let, let's... Uh, no, yes, and I think, think it's important to so this word of intervention uh, multiple layer, if we think about, um, you know, architectural structure, what she does, thinking about the cage, but what, what she does with the, her work in the space, it's not just 
mm-hmm. playing with that. She really does an intervention on the space, you know, either outside, if you think of Casa de Vidro, mm-hmm. what happened there, what she, how she decided to hang the work inside, but then there was a work outside going around a tree, you know, all this relationship that she, for her is, she mentions. In the conversation that I, was, I had with her last year, uh, she said that how it's important for her, this relationship with nature, you know, with the outside. If, if we think, for instance, in the installation at Maspi, also the works were directly in the floor. Very specific decisions about uh, how it's supposed to be presented. There was no separation, no indication of don't get closer. Right. You know, yeah. Which is, she was mentioning that it's, it's important to me that people look at work that it's, there's no barriers between the public and 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 the work. And she was even saying it seems that it's delicate, but it's a very strong work. You know, so I, it can handle. So all of those very specific, thoughtful decisions. And at Maspi, when you would go in to, the, it was not a super big uh, uh, gallery. But there, and it was all glass, but there's a moment yeah. there's a little little garden. Mm-hmm. Then you go there, there's like a gaiola. Incredible. It would be like, oh my God, you know? This, <laughs> Do you think this. there's a little bit of like a sort of anti-modernism to all this? Because I keep thinking about the symbolism of the grid, which is part of textiles, just in the weave of the, a lot of these fabrics. And also in a lot of these cages that we see, they have like, you know, these bars, these orthogonal lines that structure them. And the way that she comes in and disrupts that. And like, I think, you know, you can see that in a lot of other textile based practices in the work of Latin American artists who, um, I think come up like, and this maybe goes like, who, who come up with like an alternate grid, right? A grid that emerges from weaving that is irregular and mm-hmm. goes against the sort of hyper rational grid that you have, you know, f- articulated by a lot of European uh, artists through, you know, beginning with perspective. Um, and so, like, I wonder if there's a little bit of that also at, at work, and like maybe not in a conscious manner, but it's it's almost like it's suggested there a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's an anti-modernist per se, as you're saying, that this consciousness, but it, I think it's the type of work, as in other artists, that really invite us to rethink mm-hmm. what we think it's, you know, is, is a modernist greed or a modernist take on work, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I think, I do, I do think those, um, that, that's a, a type of practice. It's a practice, for instance, that kind of, invites you to think, oh, Gabriel was making a point about the known object, right? Which for mm-hmm. me is very interesting. I'm very interested in that, interested in that. Um, which is a specific discussion when we are thinking about uh, the, the artistic production from Brazil and what does it mean is really taking a step further and going back to the things because her, her objects are like things, right? When you look at it. What is it to think about the things? I think that's the invitation. And in the sense, I think can, there can, could be, we could think of a tension of how there's a way that we are used to think about the artistic production from Brazil. And there are many, many artists um, who come from a, a different tradition, obviously, right? They are bringing other ways to look at that. So I think it could be very productive to, t- to think, not to define it as anti anything, but to, to think about this other ways that this work allows us to think, you know, about the artistic production from, from Brazil, for instance, from Latin America, mm. uh, in a more extensive way, I do think. Mm. So yeah. tell me more about what you saw, or you discussed with Juliana, because I feel like we never got to it. <laughs> Well, I, I have this continued um, conversation with artists, with Sonia as well. So last year I spent, and went there, not for an interview, for a coffee, because then it's a different, right? It's yeah. a, we have things that we need to talk. And, and also it's, 
it's going to be informal, but then, you know, there's not a set of specific questions. And also we, uh, that's where you obviously have the opportunity to hear about details or mm -hmm. see the things that you would otherwise. Uh, so we, it was, was, it was a coffee, four hours coffee and we talk and we, also because, uh, Michaela, uh, when I came back to Brazil, uh, in 2014 and I started doing studio visit with artists, I figured that I couldn't do the way that I was used to doing the US. Being a Brazilian, living in, in Brazil for, I don't know, over 30 years, I kind of forgot it for a little bit. So I, I started with this very structured, let's talk about the work and it did not work. So then I entered in this other mode, which is my original mode, so to speak. Uh, so this is to explain to you that's the conversation that I've been having. And one of those conversations, I'm always in conversation with, for instance, with Juliana dos Santos, who has been for a few months now working as Sonia's assistant. And we were actually chatting and she said, wow, you know, I'm super um, intrigued by Sonia's process. And we were talking about, specifically about the uh, the a set of work that is the torsions, torsions. So she was explaining to me that um, we were discussing, she was explaining how it's a process that Sonia, um, torsions, uh, the twist, uh, she, it, there's a, a base which is the eye, uh, wire, mm -hmm. it's a malleable wire. And Juliana was saying, you know, it's not just going in, she goes and she feels, so those words would come again. She experiments the wire. And then there's a, a moment that she's gonna make a decision on which way she wants it to go, but she also wants to feel which way it wants to go. Mm. And in order to do that, because it's wire, it's malleable, but it's wire. So the way she does it, that Juliana was saying that it's very physical, how she sometimes has to put her body in to trying to torse it, yeah, to twist to a, a that side and pull, that push and pull dynamic, the negotiation with the material that happens really reminds me. I mean, going back to this, like the non object, it makes me think of like the bichos for a lot of like Lija Clark's work where yeah. you can bend it and, and there are hinges that allow mm -hmm. you to manipulate the material, but it will only go so far. Like you also kind of have to respect the structure to a certain degree that's already in place. So it's not an infinite amount of possibilities. Um, yeah. There's a little bit of that too here, this negotiation with the material, this, this you know, finding a way where she, her will is being expressed, but it's also in dialogue or in response to what the material is doing. Yes, and, and Juliana was talking about the body and then she was talking about the body. How is it so we, we need to do that with the body and it's not forcing the wire into something, but really an attention negotiation with how we're going to do. And she said, ah, sometimes I go strong and I get frustrated. And she said, no, it's not about strength. It's about a, a feeling and going with it. Uh, but also after that, this, this is like the, the bones of the work, but then we have, you know, the, all the fabric that goes um, on it. And then the decisions, um, mm -hmm after she covers it with the fabric, all the decisions. And Juliana used the, the word, because she was saying, well, first there's the, the, the wire, which is the bones, and then there's the, the, the fabrics that gives some, the volume, the decisions about the volume. And then she said, and then comes the painting. So well, what do you mean by painting? Oh, we call it painting, uh, the, the, the final touch, the decisions about colors. Oh, there's so many, there's, the, the fabrics that we use, there's the texture is going too much in that direction. So let's come to another direction. Uh, or the colors or the layers or the level of transparency or not transparency, what's showing, what's not showing. There's a lot of, a lot of objects also, right? That we find in, in the work. So I'm also intrigued by this idea of the question that I, I would pursue I keep on pursuing, so well, how? So if she's using the, the word painting to the process of um, uh, superposition uh, or superposition of layers of 
play, decision of play with colors, of uh, composition, really. So how does it expand my ideas of painting, right? And for me, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense because there, there are other artists that I've been thinking this in the same way when I think about, let's say, uh, um, uh, Ligia Lisboa, which is fabric, but it's crochet fabric. Mm -hmm. So the specific ways that she deals with colors, you know, the type of composition that she does reminds me what you do when you're thinking about painting. Uh, those, those things are also for us to, to remind us is because sometimes you go too much on one, the biography, mm -hmm. and two, ideas of instinct, you know, mm -hmm. intuition, it's always there, but we don't go into practice, conscious decisions, going back with this because that's not going the way that I want to do. The same things that you do in a, in a you know, in, let's say in a painting on other types of sculpture. And I think it's very important for us to not um, just allow ourselves to go into those, maybe because we don't know what to do with those objects. That's why we get so much uh, uh, wired or, or placed in, in her biography. Right. While the practice has so much for us to really slow down and say, well, let's, let's see how it's done, what, 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 where the work, the object, the thing <laughs> takes us. No, I think that's an excellent point because, you know, you're right that there ends up being this, uh, this over-dependency on the biography. And sometimes the reading of her work becomes over-determined by these questions of race and politics. And there were these really wonderful quotes that, you know, were shared during our talk. But I think it's also important to remember that well, you know, when I was talking to Sonia, I asked her point blank, do you see a, a certain populist politics to your work? Or, you know, how do you, and she was like very clear. She was like, no, for me, that comes after. It's part of a discourse. When she's creating, it's a space of like radical freedom for her during which she doesn't really think about all these questions. She's just, you know, really engaging more with the medium and the way that that category of medium can be complicated. Um, and I, I, you know, so it, it this we have to pay attention to that too and we also have to respect that that space that she's carving out for herself we only have a couple of minutes left um actually we're i think we're already over <laughs> over the time uh, so i wanted to give you the opportunity to share any last thoughts that that you had uh based on like what you heard during the conversation yeah no i think it was it was good what we discussed now the only thing i think the only point that i would make that is this is uh um, um, work, a practice that is offering us um, the possibility of really uh, uh, slowing down, engaging with it, and, and see where, what is the, what are the questions that it allows us to ask? You know, what is the, or what is the, um, the point that is allow us to make about the work? I think it's, it's such a, uh, uh, a it's a very rich um, process, practice of, that Sonia has. And then I'm using the word practice mm -hmm. because I also think this word allow, will give us the chance to think about different things, um, even more expanded if you just think about the object, the specific object that she does. What is it? What is Sonia's, Sonia Gomez's practice? And what it or teaches us or tell us or what are the questions that uh, it allows us to think about okay. Well, thank you so much, Fabiana. It was really great to hear your thoughts on this. My and pleasure. I hope we'll have other opportunities to keep talking about this work. That's for sure. Thank you. Bye. Take care.